How was vacation? Well, vacation was interesting to say the least. Amen. I mean, we uh, we knew because our son John, you know, has a a fishing lure company, so we knew, and he represents one of the oldest fishing rod companies in the world, in the, in the United States of America. So we had to go to the ICAST show for those reasons. And so we knew that was going to be a work week, the first week, which it was. And it was extremely hot and extremely rainy. And when you get rain and heat every day, the humidity is absolutely atrocious. So it was not a lot of fun, to say the least, as far as the temperature went. Uh, you know, we did the media, I mean, the, the, you know, the trade show. It was good. It was productive. Uh, but then we, on our way back, we always stopped by some friends of ours that live in, in Florida. And uh, they've been here before. I mean, he's been to the church multiple times and stuff. And we stopped there. Every time we go to Florida, we stop and see him. And his mother's 97. And so we knew she was, you know, on her way to heaven, on her way out. We'll put it that way. And uh, uh, so we stopped and spent some days with them there. And uh, when we talked to him at the trade show, he was, you know, everyth he, he, everything, last time he talked to her, she was doing pretty good. But when we got there after the trade show, he went straight home. We got there the next day, and uh, she had taken a major turn for the worse. And so for the next three days, uh, she was on hospice, and we was there waiting for her to pass. And so she did pass, you know, while we were there. And so that, you know, ends up being a ministry time. And when you're in the ministry, you're always, and as a believer, you're always ready to minister to someone, some way, some shape, somehow. And so that consisted of, you know, talking with them and, and then putting puzzles together. We put four puzzles together. I haven't put a puzzle together since I was a kid. I mean, and they were pretty intricate puzzles, you know, and so... And not just, you know, a few hundred pieces, a thousand pieces. And so that was interesting, you know. But you're up till two or three in the morning doing that, you know, because they're up and you're trying to minister to them and love on them. And, uh, you know, I know that it was on his heart because he was very deeply concerned about his mother's salvation. And uh, his father passed away 30 some odd years ago and he had gotten saved before he passed away. But his mother kind of didn't want to hear anything about God. And so I, I spent several hours praying about the situation. And uh, the Lord began to speak to me about it. And she was from Germany. She was a war bride. Uh, his father was serving in Germany during World War II. Met her. They got married. Came back to the States. And so... Uh, the Lord began to speak to me about why she didn't really want to talk about God or the things of God. One was World War I, because her grandfather was shot in World War I, which they actually still had the bullet that was removed from his body, uh, and uh, uh, some other things, paraphernalia along that line. So that affected her. And then World War II you know, that had a major effect on her family, and so she was mad at God about it. I'd never known that. We never talked, her and I never talked about any of those things, but uh, so the Lord spoke to me and said she's very bitter about World War II, and then she's mad at me because her husband passed away, and uh, she was blaming me for it. He said, but I've been talking to her, this is what the Lord said, I've been talking to her for several days, about all this. And, it, she, and, 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 and some of you may have heard me say, uh, Sister Jeannie Wilkerson, the Lord spoke to her some years ago. Now, if you're not familiar with who Jeannie Wilkerson is, she was a tremendous prayer warrior, a prophetess, a true prophetess, and a tremendous prayer warrior. And uh, the Lord spoke to her and said that if you'll call your family members' names out before me in faith, he said, I will wrestle with them on their deathbed to make sure they make heaven. Well, you know, when someone of that caliber makes a statement that that's what the Lord said, I think that might be, I didn't turn my, my ringer thing down. 
uh, then you can almost take that to the bank. Because, and then, you, so what does the scripture say? Scripture says not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants all men to be saved and come into knowledge of the truth. And he also said, come, let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. That word plead there means to argue. And so the thing is, if we can argue their cases before God in faith, then God said, I'll wrestle with them on their deathbed to get them to heaven. And I so said that to him back in February, because when we was down there for Brother Keith Moore's meeting, we was coming back and we stopped to see him. And uh, that's when he, you know, you know, voiced his concern about her salvation. And, uh, and I, I told that to him, what Sister Wilkerson had said. And I said, we need to call her name out before God in faith. And so the Lord spoke to me and said, I've been dealing with her for several days. And she's come around. And so the pastor, his pastor there in Florida, had went to meet with her. And she said, I've always believed in God. And I believe in Jesus. But she didn't tell them why she didn't want a lot to do with God because she was mad at God. Well, y'all have never known anybody that's mad at God? Y'all ever been mad at God? Well, there's reasons why it happens. It's because we lose a loved one or something happens or whatever, and we want to blame God. You know, and I mean, just in the natural, if you have a, if you have a hurricane or a tornado, whatever, they blame God for that. They call it an act of God. That's what the, the insurance companies do. Well, it's the wrong God. He's not the one out stealing, killing, and destroying Jesus came and might have life and have it more abundantly. And the Lord said to me, he said, I've been wrestling with her. And she's come around and she's accepted that. And he said, she don't have to pray a formal prayer. All she has to do is call. And then he reminded me of multiple scriptures says, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, we think we have to say a, a formal prayer. Y'all listening? All we have to do is call on the name of Jesus. And whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. And so anyway, I was able to minister that to him, and that really helped him and blessed him. And, uh, you know, so thank God for that. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we finished that up, and we started, and then during the process, then we got a phone call from, uh, uh, actually from Bill and Dawn, you know, Janice's brother and sister-in-law, and Bill had, was in the hospital having chest pains and, and things. And, and so that was pretty interesting for a while. So we was up late at night and, and dealing with those things. And thank God, you know, we prayed and believed God and he came through that. And so they're on their way to Texas right now, taking back their grandson because the doctor said he could. He's okay. So praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> Amen. Then we got a text from Karen, her grandson had had some issues, and so we need to pray about those things. So, I mean, so it was, it was not your normal uh, every day, just lay back and prop your feet up on the beach vacation. So then we ended up in Tennessee, and so we we're in Tennessee, and we was gonna, our goal was to go fishing. And we went out one day in Florida for a little bit. It was rained every day, like I said, lightning, terrible. And so it was hot, blazing hot, and I just didn't want to go out there in that heat. So we got to Tennessee. We thought it's cooler. It's nicer. We're going to go fishing one day. So John and his buddy and I, we got in the boat and took, on up, took off up the river. And running up the river about 60 miles an hour, there was a submerged log all the way across the, the, the between buoy to buoy. That's how big it was. And we hit that at about almost 60 miles an hour. Which, in all natural things, should have happened was it should have ripped the hole in the bottom of the boat. It should have ripped the motor off the boat and should have thrown all three of us out of the boat. That's what should have happened. It should have destroyed the lower unit. It should have done all those things. Yeah. But we go through that. And so as soon as it happens, we're still floating. And there's no water coming into the boat. So we went over to a boat ramp that just happened to be right there. And we got out. We started examining things. And I went underneath the water. They held the boat. And I went underneath it and come all the way down the whole bottom of the boat. There's no damage to the boat. So we started looking at the motor, and which the, the lower unit should have been gone. It wasn't even cracked. That thing cut through that log. 
I mean, it's like a hatchet. It just cut through that log and never hurt the lower unit on the motor and never had never bent the prop, never did any of those things. All those things should have happened. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, that, that could have killed all three of us very easily. And it has, and has in the past and other people, you know. But it was the mercy of God and the grace of God. Now, the thing was, was really strange about it is after we, so we drove the boat back. So, I mean, it's like we, you know, we, just, we didn't go fishing because after that you just kind of, you know, you want to get it up on the trailer and really look at it closely and stuff. And, and so anyway, but as we're coming back, where that log was that we hit, it's no longer there. It's gone. And about that time, a boat with a whole family in it coming down the river with what? how many kids do you think, John? Six. six kids up in the front with no life jackets or anything on. They're coming right down where we had just hit that log. And if we wouldn't have hit that log, that log was cut in half. It was gone. It totally disappeared. We looked for it when we came back through, and it was not there. But where they went, they would have hit that log. And if they would have hit that log in that boat, they weren't going like we were. They would have hit that, that, their lower unit would have hit that. It would have been an immediate stop, and those kids would have all flown out of the front of that boat. You're saying God caused that to happen? No, but God allowed it to happen. Y'all listening? So this, this, this is the thing. We got back you know, to, the, you know, to where our cabin was, and John got an email from a gentleman we know. He's a pastor in Atlanta. And we see him you know, normally down at Brother Keith's meeting in, in Branson, and then we see him down in Florida, Brother Keith's meeting down there, him and his wife, Gloria. Uh, <clears throat> we, got, we developed a friendship with him and stuff, but we don't talk frequently. And so he sends John a text. He said, you guys okay? He said, you've been on my heart. He said, I've been praying for you. That was just two hours after we'd hit that log. Y'all listening? God, huh? Yeah, so he was praying for us before we went fishing. So he had been praying for us before that happened. Because the text was sent before so there's no doubt God had him praying for us. And so the next morning, about 5.45 or so in the morning, I was walking, you know, out there outside of the area where, we, where our cabin was. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why didn't you say something to me about that log? Why didn't you do something? Why, why did we have to even hit it? And uh, <clears throat> and I said, Lord, I, did I miss it somewhere? I, I, I just, I want to know. I mean, how many of y'all don't want to miss it? I don't want to miss it. And I, I, don't want, I don't want those things to happen. Now, nothing happened. It's like I said, I mean, it did bend our jack plate a little bit, but that's all repairable, and so no issues with that. But, and I'm like, why? Why didn't you just tell me about it? How many of y'all remember me telling you the story about the missionary brother Boley? That was in Africa. Mm -hmm. And a couple of different instances with him. One, he had to go get a, they had to go recover a girl who had been taken by another tribe. <clears throat> and they was going to kill them. And so one of the other missionaries was awakened to pray for them. And then another instance, he was going out to an island off the coast of Africa. And it was a bad storm. And they got out there. And the captain of the boat says, all we can do is just try to run the thing aground, and it's going to destroy the boat. But if we stay out here, we're all going to die. And then there was another lady missionary that was awakened, and she was praying for him in the spirit. And they said all of a sudden that boat was lifted up and carried over the rocks and set down inside of the harbor, safe harbor. Supernatural manifestation of God's power. I said, Lord... I said, why didn't you tell me? And the first thing he did, he brought back that to, to my remembrance. He said, Brother Bowley didn't have to go during the storm. 
He could have went at a different time. But he chose to go when the storm was going on. And he said, but I had somebody praying for him because he chose to go during the storm. And he said, I, I saved him and spared him. He said, I knew you was going to go out there and go up the river to go fishing. And he said, I knew it was all there. And he said, I had somebody praying for you so nothing would happen to you. And then as we was driving the church this morning, he said to me, he said, had I not allowed you to do it, he said, several of those children would have died in that other boat. He said, you don't think about things like I think about things. And you don't see things the way I see things. He said, to spare their lives, I used you and I used another person to make sure you were spared. Are y'all listening? See, his ways are so far above our ways. You know, we don't understand all these things. Y'all out there? But thank God for his mercy and his grace. Thank God for the things he does. Amen. Hallelujah. So that was our vacation. Amen. So now it's time to rest. But anyway, it was good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, if you would open your Bibles to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Uh, so we were sitting down yesterday. We was on our way back, and we stopped in Paducah to get something to eat there at a restaurant. And, and while we were sitting in a restaurant, I got my phone out, and I was looking, and, and uh, I had gotten a message from someone from Olney, Illinois. And you all know that we go to Olney you know, yearly and do meetings and uh, throughout the course of being there, we've seen people saved and people healed and delivered and people filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and so there's a young man by the name of Levi that uh, when we were there some years ago, at that time, I think he was like 12 or 13. But he had his own business. He was a go-getter, you know, just the kind of kid you like to see around. You know, I mean, he, he had his own lawn mowing business, and, and so he was working and stuff and making his own money and doing all those kind of things. And so he came to the tent. <clears throat> he attended the Methodist church there in town. And he came to the tent and gave his heart to Jesus and got born again. And uh, then over a period of time, we prayed for him and God filled him with the Holy Ghost for the evidence of speaking other tongues. And so we've watched him throughout the years, and he, is, he, he, he told me, he said this, this last year, we were there, he said, I believe God's called me to preach. Amen. And so I said, well, praise the Lord, Levi, if that's what God wants you to do, you didn't do what God tells you to do. And so he, I know he spends all this time with the pastor from the church, helps him do anything that the pastor needs done, he's right there to help him do it. Well, they right now are in Africa. They're there on a missionary trip. The pastor and uh, Levi and Levi's mother and another person, they're over there on a missionary trip right now in Africa. And so they sent me a video of Levi. They, you know, they asked him you know, to give his testimony. So they called him up to give his testimony. And he got up there and just preached him a sermon. <laughs> Amen from Luke 19, about Zacchaeus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it, what blessed me, and the reason that they wanted me to, have the, you know, to see the video, is he said, there was a man named David Harbison came to our town. And he said, as a result of him coming to our town, he said, I got born again, I got saved. He said, I got Jesus in my life. He said, it's changed my life forever. And he said, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. And that it doesn't matter what you are, what you have, or what you don't have. Just like Zacchaeus was looked down on as a, because he was a tax collector. And he was looked down on. And they wrote him off in society. He said, some of you people may feel the same way. But Jesus came for you just like he came for Zacchaeus. Hallelujah. That just blessed my socks off. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's in Africa preaching the gospel. He's like 15 years old. He's preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Well, that's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? Look at Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> Notice what it says here in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped them, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, that means authority, is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever you have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you even unto the end of the world. Well, other translations say, Go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. See, our job is to disciple people and to make disciples of people. And a disciple is a disciplined follower of the teacher. See, we're here to teach you about Jesus. Our goal is not for you to be our disciples. Our goal is for you to be his disciples. Amen. And for us to make disciples of people, then what we want to do is teach you to become a close follower of Jesus Christ. Because we want to teach you about Jesus. So we want you to be a close follower of Jesus so that you do the things that Jesus would ask you to do. Amen. And what things did Jesus ask us to do? Well, we know one thing he said. He told us to do this in Mark chapter 16, to go into all the world and preach or make known or proclaim the gospel to every creature. That means we're not talking about you know, dogs and cats and bulls and horses and all that. We're talking about human beings. Yeah. So we're supposed to go and share this good news with the lost and the dying world. How many realize there's plenty of lost, dying people out there in the world today? Huh? There's so many young people out there that don't know anything about God. They have no clue about God or the things of God. They don't know anything at all, but they need to know about Jesus. Because we know this, the time is short and Jesus is coming back. We know that the, the Bible talks about signs that we would see before Jesus came. We taught about that very intricately for several months back a couple years ago about signs we would see before Jesus comes back. And we are seeing all those signs take place. The signs that we thought 40 years ago that would happen weren't even close to the things we're seeing now. We didn't comprehend how bad things could really get. We never realized how perverted things could get. We had no idea how far the devil would take man in trying to destroy destroy this earth, we had no idea how far that would go. We didn't, we had no clue. We didn't think we would have them to wanting to take children at three and four and five years of age and start mutilating their bodies or grooming them to mutilate their bodies at such a young age. We had no idea that this, that people were capable of even doing those things because we weren't raised that way. Y'all listen to what I'm saying? And now we see those things happening. We see how far things have, have gotten. When we look at what Romans chapter 1 says, and we see about those things, the debauchery we've spoken of in Romans chapter 1, it was, we had no clue what it was going to be like. Now we're living in a world that's full of it. Full of it. And the Satanism and all those things is coming to the forefront. We had glimpses of it. We had bits and pieces of it back years ago when Dungeons and Dragons first came out. I mean, y'all remember when that first happened? The church world began to realize, hey, you know, there's something not right about that. Because they would play those games. And in the course of those games, if they needed help, they would draw a pentagram and they would summon demons to help them. And I remember years ago, some of you may remember this, right over here at Washington University, two men and one lady, one young girl, they got together playing Dungeons and Dragons, and then the demon that they summoned to help them told them to kill that girl, and they killed that girl and took off and ended up in Georgia when they finally caught him. How many of y'all remember that story? Because the demon they summoned told them to do that. So you knew there was some of those things going on. And then you had Michael Aquino. You all remember him? He was a, a colonel in the U.S., I guess, Army, but he was detached out here. I guess he was at, detached at the record center over on Page. And so he was, he was a Satanist high priest and started Church of Satan here in this area. How many of y'all remember that? So we saw those things and we thought, well, that's pretty bad, pretty bad. But now you look at what's going on. Now they go in, Satanists go into to Target and they sell clothes. 
Y'all listening? That are say to you, know, this things on them are satanic in nature, and I mean, and they're trying to reach the kids. They want the kids. Some of you may have saw the video, you know, the protest in New York City, and they were marching, and they said, "We're here. We're queer. We want to get your kids. We're here. We're queer, and we're not going to stop." Hello. We never saw those things. We never dreamed those things could happen. We knew that Stalin said, if you give me a kid till the age of their seven, and I'll have a communist for the rest of their life. I knew Stalin said that. But we had no idea the things we would see today. We need to be making disciples today of people to go out and reach this world because this world needs Jesus more now than ever before. Oh, yeah. Because he's coming back, and it's not his will that any should perish. That means none of them. That means even those individuals. That's why I even pray for these individuals in charge. I pray for the leaders of this nation. And I don't mind if they end up in heaven living right down the street from me. I really don't, because that means they had to change. That means they had to give their heart to Jesus. That means the evil that they did will be overcome by the blood that was shed at Calvary's cross. Y'all, this is what we're saying? But in order to reach people, we got to get out there and reach them. And so my desire today is to have your heart stirred just like Levi's was. Just like Levi. To go out and tell somebody. They said, come give your testimony. And he preached them a message. Hallelujah. Said, God's come for everybody. Doesn't matter whether you got something or don't have anything. Doesn't matter whether you're good, bad, or ugly. Doesn't matter any of those things. Jesus shed his blood for you. And that's exactly what he did for all the people in the world today. He shed his blood for every single one of them. We may not agree with them. We may not even like what they're doing. But he still died for them. They're still created in his image. They're still, listen, amen. Created by Almighty God. Yes. Yeah, but they're evil. Well, God never created the devil to be evil either. Yes, that's right. But he still created him. Yes. Y'all listening? Yes. Hallelujah. Turn, if you would, the Gospel of John. Chapter 8. Let's, let's, I want to focus on verses 30, 31, 32, but let's back up to verse 29. Well, let's back up to actually the verse 28. Then says Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, that shall ye, that then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Notice that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not let me alone, for I do always those things that please him. When we was in Florida, we went to church with our friend. And the pastor, you know, preached a good message, you know. And and I was talking with the pastor afterwards. He said, you know, he said, I've read the Bible for a long time. And he said, just recently, he said, I read in the Old Testament where it said, he said, you know who the the meekest man is on the earth? And I said, well, I can tell you this. I can tell you everybody says Moses. And the Bible says that, that Moses was the meekest man. But I said, really, I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the meekest of everyone. Because in John chapter 4, in John chapter 5, in John chapter 6, and in John chapter 7, 
Jesus alludes to things just like this. But in some of those, he says, I have not, I'm not here to do my will. In John chapter 4, he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. I come to do the will of the Father who sent me. In John chapter 5, he said the same thing. I'm not here to do my will, but the will of the Father sent me. In John chapter 6, he said the same thing. But he also alluded to it in John chapter 7. And now we see John chapter 8, and he says it right here. I only do the things that please the Father. Yes. I want to please him and him alone. Yeah. Are you all listening? Yeah. That's what Jesus said. Now, remember what I said earlier? We're supposed to make disciples, yeah. disciplined followers of the teacher. The one who taught us is Jesus. You all listening? We see it in the Bible. That's what we're being taught. We're being taught from the Word of God. And it's Jesus that's doing the teaching. The Holy Ghost is the author of the book. We know he's the third part of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost are all three. They're one. Jesus is the Word that became flesh. The Holy Ghost uses the Word to teach us. When the Bible says in John's epistle, when he says, you have no need of a teacher, but the Holy Ghost will teach you. He didn't say we didn't have to have natural teachers because the Bible says he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saints till we come to the unity of the faith and then the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect and mature man that we're not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine and all those other things. So we have teachers that he places in the body to teach what? To teach the Word. If we're teaching the Word, we're teaching Jesus. If we preach the word, we're preaching Jesus because he's the word that became flesh. Amen. And the Holy Ghost is always using the word for us to teach and to develop people. And he says right here, he said, I only want to do the things that please the Father. That's right. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now watch as we go further here. He says this. Hallelujah. In verse 30, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Verse 31, then said Jesus, those Jews which believed on him. So if he's talking to Jews that believe on him, he's also talking to Gentiles that believe on him. And guess what? That's us. So he's talking to us if we believe on him. He's talking to anyone that believes on him. That's just what he's saying. He said, if you continue in my word, he said, then ye are my disciples indeed. What's a disciple? A disciplined follower of the truth, of the teacher. He's the truth. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So notice what he says here. The first thing he says, I always do those things that please him. So that's what Jesus did. He did things to please the Father. If we're going to be a disciplined follower of the teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, then that means we ought to do the things that please God as well. Those are the things we ought to want to do. We want to please him, not please ourselves. Or not even please other people. Are we going to be men pleasers? Are we going to be God pleasers? We should want to please God. In everything we do. Y'all listening? Our conduct, our actions will show up one day. There will be consequences for the things that we do. Now consequences are not always bad. Consequences can be good. That means if you do the right thing, the consequence could be a reward. Well, you mean God's got rewards for us? Well, the Bible says so. He said, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, do we have any examples of that reward? Do we have any example of those consequences? Absolutely. One in the form of Enoch. What, did, what was the consequences of Enoch walking with God for 300 years? He was translated. That means him and God would fellowship. Every day they did it for 300 years. 
I heard one person say because it was 365, he was 365 when he was caught up. But that's not true because we know that he didn't serve God for the first 65 years. It wasn't until his son was born that he started serving God. That's what the Bible says. So for the next 300 years, he walked with God. And he pleased God. And he did it by faith. What was the consequences of him pleasing God? He was not. Why? Because God took him. Hello? Is that a bad thing? No. The first rapture mentioned in the Bible was that man that walked with God faithfully for 300 years. He walked with him and God said, I don't want to leave you this time. I don't want to go back and leave you here. This thing we got is just too special. This is just too precious. And so I just can't leave you here. So you come go with me. No, he didn't say pack up all your belongings because he didn't need to bring anything with him. He just needed to enjoy what was there. But God said, you come and be with me. And he was not because God took him. That was a consequence for doing the right thing. See, consequences don't always have to be bad. But there are consequences for our actions. And if we do the right thing, the consequence is a good thing. If we do the wrong thing, the consequence can be a bad thing. But there are consequences. Are y'all listening? Hallelujah. We know Elijah was the second rapture. What did he do? He served God. He didn't bow his knee to the image of Baal. When all the pressure was on him to do so, he didn't do it. But rather, he challenged the prophets of Baal. Y'all listening? He didn't give in to them. He challenged them. And he stood for Almighty God. And when it was just seemingly himself, that one man, James says, who was just like we are, the same, kind, you know, same thoughts, same things that we go through in our life, he went through. Yeah. But yet that one man, the Bible says, he prayed earnestly and it didn't rain for three and a half years because of one man's prayer. Yeah. 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 One man, earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer caused God to stop the rains. And then, listen, that affected the whole known world. Yes. One man's prayer. That lets us know the consequence of one person's heart being right with God and doing what God asked them to do can have an effect on the whole world. Yes. Yes. Think about that. One man's tenacity, one man's earnestness, one man's desire to please God. What did Jesus say? I only want to do the things that... Please him. One man does that and it affects the world. Yes. And then that one man prays again. And this time the rain comes. He stands up for God. Y'all listening? Earnestly seeking God. Even though he ran from Jezebel, he thought he was all alone. That's why he ran. He thought he was all alone. He ended up in the mouth of the cave. But God let him know he wasn't alone. First, the whirlwind came. The fire came. God wasn't in those things. See, he knew God well enough that just because it was something spectacular, it didn't have to be God. That's right. That's right. Y'all listening? See, we have a tendency to think that if something's spectacular, it must be God. Oh, no. No, he knew it wasn't God. Now, he saw God do spectacular things. Y'all listening? Because when he asked for fire, God sent fire. Not once, not twice, but three times we know of. Y'all listening? When 50 soldiers came out to get him, he called fire down, God sent fire. When they came out against him again, he called fire down, God sent fire. When they came out again, this guy had enough sense. Whoa, please, 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 stop. Don't say anything. I'm only here because the king made me come. 
<coughs> don't destroy me and my men because of what he said. Because this guy's got access to fire. And when he challenged the prophets of Baal, he told them, said, listen, we're going to see who's God's really God. And so I want you to do this. You do your thing. You go out there. You build your sacrifice. You put, your, you put, you build the, you know, put the wood out there. Put the, the sacrifice on it. And you call on your God. And we're going to see who's God answers with fire. And they tried and they tried and they tried. They spent the whole morning. They started cutting themselves. They started doing, and he's low. I could see him over there. He's kind of laid back, leaning against his arm, you know. Uh, maybe he's going to sleep. Yell a little louder. You might wake him up. Maybe he's gone on vacation. Finally had enough of it. I mean, they're cutting themselves, bleeding all over the place, all kinds of They couldn't get their God to do anything. And so what do you say? Now it's my turn. So he remade everything. He did it the way it's supposed to be done, according to the law. And then he said, now dig a trench around this thing. And he said, bring some water and pour water on it. And bring more water and pour water on it. Until they saturated the whole sacrifice, all the wood, and filled up that trench full of water. And then he called on his God. Now you'd have thought these people already had a clue because they know about him calling fire down. So they called on, he called on his God and the fire came. And consumed the sacrifice. Then he took a sword and slew all those prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel said, you're a dead man. And one woman sent him running. And he ended up in the mouth of the cave. And that's when he saw spectacular things, but he knew what God wasn't in it. And then he turned into the mouth of the cave and all of a sudden he heard that still, small voice and he covered his head up because he knew he was in the presence of almighty God and God spoke to him and said listen you're not alone I got 7,000 more that haven't bowed their knee to the image of Baal have you ever felt alone in the world in which we're living right now as a Christian believe me those that are with us are far greater than those that are against us. Oh, yeah. Because we don't just have other, bro other brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got angelic hosts that are on our side, just like Elisha had. Y'all listening? So Elijah pleased God. He did what God wanted him to do. And guess what? God sent a whirlwind, a chariot of fire, and brought him to heaven. The consequences of him doing what God wanted him to do, what was the consequences? He never died, did he? The enemy ever, never got to him, did they? They never harmed him, did they? What were the consequences? God sent a chariot of fire. And brought him to heaven. The second rapture. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. What happens to us to please him today? There's coming another rapture, folks. There's coming another rapture. So the best thing that can happen to us as believers is eternity with God. <laughs> the best consequence we can have is eternity with God. And that's what God wants us to have. And just like Enoch, he pleased God. And the consequences of pleasing God, yes. he's in heaven. Hallelujah. Elijah pleased God. And the consequences of pleasing God, he's in heaven. Yes. Jesus said, I only want to do the things that please him. The consequences of him pleasing his father, yes. he's in heaven. Hallelujah. And now the rest of us, the consequences of us being his disciples and pleasing him yes. is what? Eternity in the presence of God. Oh, Hallelujah. This is good news, isn't it? What pleases God is not his will that any should perish. <laughs> that all should repent. 
It's his will, pleases him. Go into the world and tell people about Jesus. Minister to people about Jesus. Love on people. Make disciples. Do you think it was only Jesus that helped make disciples? His disciples made disciples. When they went out two by two and preached the gospel and people believed, who were they preaching? They were preaching Jesus. They weren't preaching themselves. Who do we preach? We preach Jesus Christ. Who did Paul preach? He preached Jesus Christ. We do the same thing. We go out as disciplined followers of the teacher. We go out as his disciples and we tell other people about him and we preach Jesus. Whether it's sitting in a coffee shop, a restaurant, a grocery store, on the job, wherever the opportunity arises. Hallelujah. In John chapter 1, it talks about that he, Jesus, is the life and the light of men. That word life there is the word zoe, Z-O-E. That is the life of God. And it is the light of God that shines in the heart of a believer. That life is the light of men. That light is in us, in Christ. That light shines out of us. In this dark world, they should see that light. If we're pleasing him, that light shines bright. And God will use that light to draw people to ourselves. It's a prayer that Janet and I pray every single day. We pray that and we say, Lord, you are the life and the light of men. And that light is in our spirit, that Zoe life of God. Let that light so shine out of us that you draw men to yourself in this dark and dying world. Let that light shine out of us. Hallelujah. That life's on the inside of every one of us as a believer. It ought to shine out of us. The world ought to see it. We ought to be beacons of light. Now, not everybody's going to like it because that light dispels darkness. And when people that are full of darkness get around that light, they get uncomfortable. Y'all listening? I remember, you know, listen, Brother Copeland say, talk about one time he took his car to a shop to have it worked on, and the mechanic was in there, and he was just a cussing and carrying on. He said, I just got tired of hearing it. He said, I just walked out of the shop where he was working on it, walked into the room and said, I'm buying that devil. I refuse to listen to that trash, and he can't talk that way as long as I'm in his presence. And he said, I walked back in there, and he's messing around. He's banging, and he's doing this and doing that, trying to get it to, you know, fixed and stuff. And finally, he just stopped and turned to me and said, Preacher, would you walk out of here? Because he couldn't cuss anymore while he was there. Are y'all listening? See, that light has an effect on darkness. And if we're letting that light shine out of us, that's going to have an effect on darkness. Now, it can do multiple things. I remember years ago, Janet was there. Brother Reynolds Thomas and his wife, Vera, were there. Uh... Sister Norma Hans and her husband Gene was there. We walked in to see a lady in the hospital that went to church. We went to church over. She was over at Missouri Baptist Hospital. Had a severe kidney stone. They tried to break it with sound waves and stuff, and they couldn't, so they was going to have to do surgery. We went in to visit her, and she had another lady in her room. And when we walked in, as we was coming down the corridor of the hospital, going to the room, the Lord spoke to me. He said, you tell Evelyn when you go in there that she won't have to have the surgery because that thing's going to disappear. She's got her miracle. And so when we walked in the door, God's my witness. I didn't say anything. I had no clue. Janet was there. She saw. She heard everything that I saw and heard. And, uh, and Brother Gene and Sister Norma, Brother Ray and Sister Vera. Was Betty and Frank with us too? can't remember but anyway they were all with us and Evelyn was in the hospital room we walked in the door and when I when we walked in the door I turned to her and said the Lord said to tell you that thing's going to disappear you won't have to have the surgery you got your miracle and about that time the lady near the room started uh, the other bed started screaming I see Jesus 
I see Jesus all over you. When you walked in this room, I saw Jesus all over you. Hallelujah. I don't know if she did or not. All right. That's what she said. So I just walked over to her bed. I said, sister, I said, what's wrong with you? She said, my legs are swelling. They don't know why, and they can't get them to stop swelling. And they're swelling so bad I can't walk. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? She said, I did. She said, I used to go out on the street and talk to people about Jesus and tell people about Jesus. She said, I was born again. She said, but then I was at a tent revival one time, and, this, and that just kind of ticked me off when she said tent revival. And this preacher said that I was out of the will of God. I couldn't be saved. I was a Jezebel because I was out talking to drunk people and drug addicts about, about Jesus, and I shouldn't do that as a woman. So I just backslid. She I hadn't been, ser had been serving God. She said, now I've got this thing on me. Can't walk. I said, well, I said, I'm sorry that somebody had to be that ignorant to tell you that. I said, because that's not true. I said, but you can rededicate your life. And I said, let's get you there right now. I said, you want to give your life back to Jesus? She said, absolutely. So we just led her in a sinner's prayer. Actually, rededication prayer. And I said, were you ever filled with the Holy Ghost? She said, I heard about it, but I never did get filled. I said, well, why don't we just get you filled with the Holy Ghost right now, too? So I said, I'm going to lay hands on you. You ask God to fill you, and he's going to fill you. You start talking in tongues. And so it's like Brother Hagin always said, I did, she did, and he did. And so I laid hands on her. She asked God to fill her with the Holy Ghost, and he did. And she started talking in tongues. And I mean, she was having a time. And she come up out of that bed, and she was dancing all over the room. And she was shouting at the top of her voice. And I mean, we're, we're, that room's full of people. We're all in there. And all of a sudden, somebody went to go outside to go down the hallway to the restroom. When they opened the door, four nurses fell in. They were listening up to the door. They fell into the room. Later that afternoon, they told us, you know, Sister Evelyn told us because she was her roommate, that, they, that she was walking up down the hallways praising God. And she couldn't walk because her legs were off, but all the swelling disappeared. She was instantly healed, too. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glory to God. All I want to do, Jesus said, is the things that please him. Yes. Let that light shine. Isaiah said it this way, rise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Amen. And he said, a multitude of the Gentiles will come to the brightness of thy rising. God's going to use the light to draw the world out of the darkness. And we're the light of the world. Yes. Let that light shine. Why? Because he's in us. And he's the light of men. We need to be true disciples. And true disciples. He said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know. That word know means to act upon. It. It's the same word as a husband knows his wife. It means they too become one. When you become one with the word and the word becomes one with you, just like John 15 says. Mm -hmm. Huh? He said, then you can ask what you will and it'll be done. Isn't that right? Oh, yes. See, and ye shall know. That means embrace, become one with, and act upon. See, just the truth will not set you free. Because if all we had to do is get the truth out there and that set people free, let's get the biggest speakers we can get. Let's crank it up as loud as we can get. Let's drive through every city and we'll say, Jesus died so you can go to heaven. You don't have to go to hell. That's true, isn't it? Yes. That's, true. Yeah. That's all you have to do. And everybody be saved. No, don't work that way. They have to hear it, but then they have to act on it. Yes. Yeah. They have to receive it. They have to speak it out of their mouths. Amen. They have to do something with it. Maybe it's just calling, but that's all they have to do. Right. Because right there in that portion of Scripture, in, John, in Romans chapter 10, right there in that portion of Scripture, it says, when it's talking about they can't believe in somebody they haven't heard about, and they can't hear without a preacher, they can't preach except they be sent. But the 13th verse says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. King James says, shall not be ashamed. Other translations say saved. Y'all listening? 
All they got to do is call, but they can't call on somebody they hadn't heard about, so somebody got to tell them. Yes. Amen. But see, just the truth, just hearing the truth doesn't make you free. You have to act on that truth. But listen, you can't act on something you haven't heard. And that's why we got to tell them. That's why it says, disciples, if you continue in my words, then, then are ye my true discipline followers of me, your teacher. Amen. Yeah. And ye shall know, yeah. act on, embrace, right. put the practice, the truth. And that truth you act on, that truth you embrace, that truth's going to set you free. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Yes, amen. It's going to restore joy where sadness has taken over. It's going to restore peace where anxiety has driven your life. It's going to restore health where the devil's tried to kill you with sickness and disease. It's going to restore joy unspeakable and full of glory. Where despair has ripped your life apart. If you'll put it to practice... It's going to bring back to you everything God said you could have in Christ Jesus. Yes. Man, I'm about to just have a fit right now. Huh? Think about it. Are you all listening? Hallelujah. When I looked at that video and I saw little, little Levi standing up there. In Africa. Just a teenage boy. Preaching the gospel. I thought, there's a disciplined follower of the teacher. He's following Jesus. Hallelujah. Every single one of us ought to be the same way. And I'm not saying we all got to jump up and go to Africa. But go to your neighbor. Talk to the people in the grocery store. If the opportunity arises, I'm not telling you to force yourself on somebody. Don't be rude. You know, part of it is just loving on them. Just loving on them. Just being nice to them. Now, let me just say this. You never start walking in love because my wife and I have been doing that. We've been reading, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 in the Amplified every single day now for months and we confess it and we pray about it we talk to God about it we even made those little little cards out there you can get so you can read those you know make those confessions for yourself you ought to do it but I don't know if you're like me but I mean it's like I've I've had every opportunity to fail you can you can have <laughs> I mean it's just like I'm trying I'm doing and I talk to the Lord with tears and say God I don't want to fail this anymore I want, I want this to be so in my heart. I don't want to fail the test. I mean, you know, it's the old thing about praying for, don't pray for patience, you know. Yeah. I mean, you start confessing this. I, I mean, I never realized how bad the devil was going to test me in my love walk. So we endeavor to put it at, I mean, ultimately at the forefront of our lives. I mean, it's just like every time you turn around, there's no reason for people to act it the way they act. And they just do. Now, thank God I've passed some tests, but I haven't passed them all. Y'all listen to what I'm saying? I mean, I'm serious. And it comes in all different areas. You know, we're, we're, we're on our way to Florida. And we had gotten a candy bar. And so just before we stopped one night on the way down, after driving through Atlanta during rush hour traffic early in the morning in the pouring down rain. Now that was a love walk deal in and of itself. If you've ever driven through Atlanta... In rush hour, do it in the rain. <laughs> it's like when the rain comes out, people just go nuts. They just don't know how to do anything. So we had a candy bar, you know. So we'd get, we got down the road and we, got, and we drove all through the night. 
And so we stopped and got a room and, and Janet and I had, we both had a little piece of the candy bar and so she set it there on the console and we didn't wrap it up. And uh, when we woke up in the morning, it was sunshine. And it was hot. And you know what chocolate does in the sun? In a hot car or a hot truck? It just turns the water. Yes, it does. And I open the door and I look in, and it's just, it's just water. And where does water go? It goes the least path of resistance. It's just running down the console. And I'm like, but I passed the test. I did. Janet come walking up. I said, uh, she said, what's going on? I said, well, that candy bar, we failed to wrap it up. And it's everywhere. And so I just wiped it all up. I wouldn't have always done that. <laughs> I just wiped it up and we put it in, you had a, we had a baggie that stuck it, slid it in there and we just threw it in the trash and you know, cleaned everything up. I wouldn't have always done that. I know you're perfect. You would have never said anything. You would have just done it just every time. But, but I did. I passed the test. I turned to Janice. She says, you okay? I said, yeah, I passed the test. I passed the test. Hallelujah. Then you go down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you blowing a horn doing all kinds of stuff and I didn't pass that test. Because <laughs> see, my horn didn't work because the clock spring in our dash, you know, inside the steering wheel was messed up so my horn didn't work. So I didn't have a horn, but guess what? I got a horn now. <laughs> I didn't pass the test. Before I could hit it and it wouldn't, I, I passed by almost kind of by osmosis because my horn didn't work so they didn't know that I wasn't passing the test. But now I got a horn. So now people know I didn't pass the test. But we're striving for it, aren't we? And we're striving to do everything that pleases him. We're striving to be good, disciplined followers of the teacher. We want to be his disciples. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. Hallelujah. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know what? I didn't even look at the clock one time. And I'm doing pretty good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that the word is indeed working mightily in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, we thank you that we want to be like Levi. We just want to be a disciplined follower of our teacher, the Lord Jesus. And we want to go tell people about Jesus. We want to do everything that pleases you, Lord. That's our desire. And so, Father, we thank you for touching each and every heart and every life and helping us by your spirit to do just that. And, Father, we give you glory and honor for it. In Jesus' precious and wonderful and holy name. Now, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's no better time than right now. Remember this, tomorrow is not promised to any man. James says it this way, life is but a vapor which appeareth for a little while then vanishes away. If we didn't realize how significant that is before, Driving down the river and hitting that log 60 mile an hour. All three of us in that boat could have got killed. All three of us. It could have happened that fast. But thank God we weren't even injured. I got a little bitty scrape on my knee. That's it. Just a little scab. That's it. Because of God's grace and God's mercy. So accept that mercy and that grace today. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know what tomorrow may bring. I'm not here to preach gloom and doom. I'm just telling you the devil's out there to steal, kill, and destroy. And looking back at it now, I realize, had we not hit that, those individuals in that other boat would have. And all those little kids up there with no life jackets on would have flown out of that boat. And so, Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, 
Because, Lord, it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's no better time than the present. If you have known him, but maybe you're what we call a backslider because you haven't been serving him like you should, and you kind of went out doing things in the world and got involved in what we call riotous living, wrongdoing, whatever it is. When you say riotous living, we don't mean you're out there tearing stuff up, but you're just not living right. Just not doing the things that are right. Things that you know in your own heart that you shouldn't do. Well, you know what? The prodigal son did that too. He took his daddy's money, went out and blew every bit of it on prostitutes and partying and drinking and carrying on. But when he ended up in the pig pen of life, he came to his senses and said, you know what? Even the servants in my daddy's house are better off than I am. I'm going to go home and just see if I can be a servant. But when he came back home, his daddy saw him and come running down the road to him, threw his arms around him, hugged his neck, kissed him on the cheek, told his servants, bring the robe and put it on his back. Bring a ring and put it back on his finger. Kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a party. My son was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. That's exactly how God feels about you today if you're a backslider. He's ready to put the robe back on your back. He's ready to put the ring back on your finger. He's ready to kill the fatted calf and have a party because his lost child's come back home. Or maybe you're that church member grew up going to church but don't know if you're saved or not. You need to know that you know that you know that you're saved. And the Bible says he wrote unto us that we may know. There's no question. The blood of Jesus has washed you clean if you've accepted him. And if you don't know that, then you need to know that. So if you fall in any one of those three areas, you've never been saved, but you want to be, you have been, you backslid, you want to come back home, or you're your church member, don't know for sure, just want to make sure, and you want to know that you know that you know. If that's you, slip your hand up right now all across this room. Hallelujah. Slip your hand up and say, that's me. We'll pray for you. All right, then. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that Lord Everybody here is on their way to heaven. We're excited about that. We praise you and worship you for it. And Father, our prayer is now that every one of us will go tell somebody else about Jesus. Let's go help some other backslider come back home. Let's go help some other church member who don't know for sure if they're saved or not, make sure they know they're saved. That's what we want to do. We want to be good, disciplined followers of our teacher, Jesus. We want to be your disciples. And we want to do everything that pleases you. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.